And so that's the strategy we generally take is for the flexibility of, of you know, shorter nights stay and last minute stays and all that, we get to charge more. And um, maybe our occupancy isn't technically as high as our competitors, but our overall revenue is. Welcome to the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Katani, and the founder of Katani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators, influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? And welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Jeff Brown. Jeff is the co-founder of Loma Homes, which is a vacation rental company that specializes in providing unique and extreme experiences for its guests. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Uh, we had Brindy on um, that episode. Th these episodes will come out um, in order. So uh, this intro will make sense. But uh, Jeff and I met at a Utah RIA. Gosh, I guess that was what, a month or so ago, six weeks ago. Ended up sitting next to each other. Didn't realize we both more or less did the same thing to a degree, at least uh, at least know the same people, which uh, was was pretty funny to see that small world uh, collide. So um, you are co-founder of Lama Homes, uh, which again, provides that vacation rental. Kind of touch on getting into real estate. If I understand correctly, this was your first kind of foray into real estate. So kind of touch on that and 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 what's led you where, where you're at now. Yeah, um, I started real estate actually in the house hacking world. Um, for those of, I'm, I'm assuming that your listeners are familiar with house hacking. Uh, so when I first got married, my wife and I rented our basement to college students and uh, that worked out really well. And I think that's really what caught me on the bug for real estate. I realized the power of um, real estate. And so uh, a couple of years later, we ended up selling that house for an awesome profit and moved into another house, house hacked again. And this time house hacking, I, um, I had the, the fortunate benefit of um, renting to a, a couple that was doing um, house flipping full time. and. Uh, I could see the work they were doing. They were actually doing it across the country. And I wanted to start getting into short-term rentals. So I could see the cash flow that was being made there. And I was like, hey, this couple doesn't, you know, they do awesome flips. And I actually hired them to flip me a house in Joshua Tree, California. And uh, we kind of just had a unique kind of partnership there. Uh, paid them for that. And when it started to cash flow really well, uh, they could see what I was doing and, and said, Hey, let's, let's partner on this. Let's do this full time. And so we did. And Loma Homes was born. So, um, now I, I do kind of the, the, the data analytics, making sure we're buying in the right areas and using the right strategies. Um, they come in with the real estate experience and build out the portfolio. And then they hand it back to me to do the, uh, the, the guest relations and the hospitality management. I love it. That's awesome. And like you said, right, you're uh, kind of a data first approach here. So let's let's jump into what that means, right? So I, I don't know if a lot of people or how many of our listeners are familiar with the sort of management and the other side of the coin for short term rentals. I think everybody at this point has at least stayed in one one time. Mm -hmm. So we understand the process of, you know, going on Airbnb or VRBO and booking. But on the other side of that is a host and or, you know, someone like Loma Homes. So kind of talk about the other side, what that looks like, you know, and and kind of your guys' approach to that. Yeah, so you're talking about um, what it takes to host a property for short-term rentals. Yeah, so we'll we'll kind of touch there and then we'll go outward and, and the whole portfolio. Right, um, so being being in the numbers uh, and, and using the numbers, we quickly realized that doing Airbnb in our backyard wasn't necessarily the best route to go. We realized that the profit potential outside of our backyard was much higher. And even if that meant a logistical nightmare of managing short-term rentals, uh, you know, out of state, we were willing to do that. And, um, and that's what we did. So we ran the numbers, found Florida, yeah, to be a really, um, I mean, we're in Utah, so uh, all the way across the country. Um, 
and found some really profitable areas and, and really were able to come up with some unique strategies to kind of be in the top 10 percentile of our, I should say top 90th percentile of our, of our area. And, cool. but it also had a side benefit to, to picking out of state because with short-term rentals, you can, it's not a passive investment. And if you are, if, if, it, if the rentals in your backyard, you tend to want to be there all the time and you just take care of it yourself and that will quickly dominate your life. And so having um, out of state required us to build a scalable model where we could actually, um, you know, have a team and have a have setup that would be scalable. And uh, we've we've been doing that and, and have grown that and it's been working for us so far, not without its bumps and bruises, of course. Um, but like I said, it has its benefit of, of forcing you to think long term and think scale. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So now kind of touch on the data that you're using, right? Um, you mentioned you use data to find the market and, and the best um, profit margins. And so kind of touch on some of that data and and all the data that you're using to 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 do all of this. Sure. So um, most uh, most of anyone who's in the short-term rental industry has heard of the names I'll, I'll use, but I'll, I'll kind of go through them. So we we, we acquire third-party um, data providers like AirDNA. We use uh, Price Labs and their market dashboards. We also um, will crawl the website uh, on our own to, to get some additional metrics. And I can go through those in, in more detail, but um, we kind of try to combine as many data points as we can to get validation. Um, I don't recommend that anybody trusts just one single data source, um, but that you get multiple viewpoints on a market. But what we do is we start high level and AirDNA is really good for high level. Uh, they'll they kind of give you the, it's a good way to compare revenue potential from one city to another. And that's where we start. Um, and then from there, we we're, what we're looking for is areas that have a high revenue potential and a low, co a low cost of, of uh, real estate. So we have a ratio we use to determine if a house is a, a good market. And um, what we say is that a home needs to be, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, a home needs to be at least, um, I'm sorry, the revenue needs to be at least 20% of the value of the home. So if we're going to buy a $500,000 house, then revenue needs to be at least 100 grand. And that's including renovations and everything. So renovations plus, plus home value needs to be um, at that 20%. Uh, and, and we find that when we do that, there's enough margin still to split with our investors uh, and have some left over for us and be worth our time. Anything below that, and we just don't, don't see the margin there. Uh, that's worth it. So we use, like I said, we start with Airbnb, I'm sorry, AirDNA. And then from there, we break it down. We get some more reports. Once we kind of break it down to like a city, we get, we get started to get more location specific with reports like Price Labs. Um, and we get kind of that second opinion. And then finally, what we'll do is just look at the website, the VRBO and Airbnb ourselves, and make sure that the data that we're pulling is lining up with what we're seeing real time today. Um, and if, if it all ends up, then we found that that's been a good process. I love it. That's awesome. And obviously, you know, as you guys have found, uh, you know, as you start to refine that, right, you get better and better at it, right. And understand the, the, the data and becoming more efficient. And so when it comes to buying homes, um, you know, much like our, the approach that tech vest uses, right. Ideally buying a, just a residence, right. On a comp right? Not something that's already been set up as a short-term rental. So how are you able, what's your process for taking, you know, the price lab and an air DNA data, and then, you know, using that congruently with the MLS to sort of find the right, the right price. Yeah. So what we do uh, is, is we start with revenue and we find what the average revenue is for a given area. We then break that down into bedroom size. Uh, and say, okay, average revenue for a three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom, six bedroom. And we we tend to stay on the on the bigger side because that's generally where the higher margins are. Um, but once you have an average revenue number, then you apply your twenty percent rule, 
and you get the max purchase price. So if we find that an average six bedroom property does hundred grand, you divide that by 20%, you got 500 grand. And you say, all right, our budget for a five bedroom property is 500 grand. And now you know you have your threshold to go to Zillow or wherever and start making those, those offers. That's awesome. I love it. And uh, now, you know, kind of flipping over to the management side, the, you know, where short-term rentals are very different than any other asset class is that, you know, in a multifamily, you, you know, you want the highest occupancy you can get, but in short-term rentals, that may not necessarily be true because prices are adjusting and, and, you know, the data can be shifting. So kind of touch on, you know, that process and the management side and, and using data to, to manage effectively. Yeah. Um, what I would say, like to your point, um, you know, if you're nine percent occupied, you're leaving money on the table. Um, and if we had to choose between um, having more, a higher nightly rate and higher occupancy, well, the obvious answer is nightly rate because nightly rate doesn't bring more expenses with it, whereas occupancy does. So your margins will be higher. If you have to choose one or the other, choose rate. Um, and people are, people always ask, well, what's the occupancy? What's the rate? What really what matters is what's the revenue, right? Um, and it doesn't matter if you're getting 10% occupancy if you're charging $10,000 a night. Um, so it's a it's a balance. Um, but generally, we try to be competitive, uh, and and that depends on how how long your listing has been on the on the platforms and and all of those things. Um, but we aim to be you know, 25, 30% above market because of the design that we use and because of the specific pricing strategies that we use um, in, in our areas. Uh, that's different. I mean, anywhere you go. Um, but generally what where we are located, we're located in some pretty um, mature markets. And these mature markets ha- take longer to adapt to the j- trends in the market. So um, we find that <laughs> believe it or not, in, in Destin, the minimum night stay for most properties is seven, um, which in vacation rental space, that's unheard of, but it's yeah. because these guys have been around since before Airbnb and they were done by property management companies that didn't want to deal with nightly rentals. And so they just did, They there's property managers, they're still doing it since the old ages and they do seven, they only do check-ins on Saturday and checkouts on Saturday and they do everything on Saturdays and that's it. <laughs> But if you're willing to go in there and put in a two night minimum, willing to take some, you know, weeknights and everything, you can charge more for that. And so that's the strategy we generally take is for the flexibility of, of you know, shorter nights stay and last minute stays and all that. We get to charge more and um, maybe our occupancy isn't technically as high as our competitors, but our overall revenue is. I love it. That's awesome. And such a great approach. And obviously you guys are in the very niche space, right? Where you're, you're creating an experience more than just some place to come in and stay, which again, goes down to the bottom line and increasing your, um, increasing the revenue. When you got into these markets, was that already happening or were you guys kind of pioneering this in some of the markets that you're in? In terms of creating experiences? Yeah. The experience, a very niche, um, stay. I would like to say, I'd like to believe that we're, we kind of pioneered the experience um, it, to the level that we did. I, I don't, I wouldn't say that we're the first ones to do it, but we're the first ones to take it to the level that we did. Um, when we first started scoping out Orlando, for example, um, I looked up at the top properties, uh, top performing properties in those neighborhoods. And I remember seeing the one that that was number one and it had it had some vinyl stickers of minions on the wall. It had like a Darth Vader um, shower curtain, you know, it had maybe some bedspreads that had like princesses on them. And we thought, okay, this is what people are going to experience Disney World, right? And they want to have an extension of the theme park. So we built an extension of the theme park, but but took it to a whole nother level. So we we... We started building fog machines and and muraling every single wall and custom carved beds and all of that um, because if that's what guests are going for and that's what they're willing to pay for, let's create that experience and let's go all out and do it right. 
And we, we went with the theory that guests would be willing to pay a premium for that. And they did. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's been the, the, the additional benefit of, of doing an extreme theme is that you get a lot of um, social media attention, uh, a lot of organic uh, sharing. You know, if, if you can have a shareable content property, it'll take care of itself and people will go there, they'll share it on their social media, they'll rave about it. Uh, and you don't, it's free marketing. And um, that's what we get with our, with our themed properties. I love it. That's awesome. And yeah, I was looking at some of the pictures and, and like you said, some of those custom beds with like the millennium Falcon bed and, and uh, you know, Brittany and I chatted about how they're made and which was really cool to see and, and kind of figuring out how all of that worked. And now you guys have that method. Now you're currently going through um, an exit here, right? A little portion of your portfolio. Let's touch on that now. Um, obviously, was your goal in, did you have it in mind to kind of build this to where an institution would take notice and and sell it off and, and kind of touch on that and, and what that process has been like? Yeah, it's, a, I mean, our, 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 um, our liquidation strategy has changed, has evolved over time. But we did start with the mentality of developing a brand that we could sell to a hotel. At the time, we thought hotel is going to be the is going to be the acquirer because um, we knew that hotels were dragging their feet in short term rentals. That short term rentals were going to eat their lunch, and that we wanted to be a brand that they could use to catch up. So we wanted to have hundreds of properties ready for them that they could just swoop them up and and gain some ground in the short-term rental space. And that was our original strategy. As we moved on, we started to realize there's a whole nother market of just um, in, investors in real estate. I mean, you've got institutional investors that are buying hundreds of millions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars of real estate that they just want passive income on. And we, th- we realized we could probably get a better valuation with those folks because they're willing to buy real estate at a lower um, return. And they do that because they, they have, they're they using large amount of money. And so getting really high returns is hard to do when you're writing really large checks. So we thought, okay, well, if, if we can provide returns that are better than the real estate average, say five, 6% cap rate or even lower, then um, we can provide them a product that will give them the return they want. Um, and give us a better valuation on the properties uh, because we're buying them at residential values. And if we can sell them at income valuations, then that's a whole nother ball game. And uh, so that became, that's now our strategy and that's what we're doing. And we even realized at some point, Hey, wait a minute, we don't need to have 80 to hundred properties to start doing this. Um, we can actually just sell the title to the property, let them have the cash flow, but we can continue to manage those properties. So now we keep 20% of the revenue. Um, we have a growing property management business um, and we get to cash out the value of these homes in the short term and use that cash to build our business. And so um, it's really a sweet strategy where you get to um, both sell, you get, it's, it's very rare that you get to sell your company and keep the revenue. And uh, that's what we're doing. That's awesome. I love it. And obviously that will, that capital will go towards uh, growing and scaling. Um, the plan, as I understand, is to move into new markets. What are, you know, we kind of talked about the the data strategy there. So what does it look like? You've identified your markets, you've got the data. Now, what does it look like to go in and start acquiring and and, and building up a portfolio in, in that market? Yeah, that's that's something we're dealing with now is trying to figure out how to scale because the markets, a lot of the markets we're looking at um, don't necessarily have a ton of inventory. Um, it's just the inventory is pretty low still. And uh, we're hoping that will change soon with, um, you know, rates or rates increasing and whatnot. Um, but we currently, the rate of our purchases is is being affected by the the level of inventory. So our goal is to buy one or two properties a month that we can rehab, add value to, manage long-term um, and sell portfolios of 10 or 20 properties at a time. Um, 
but you know we're currently expanding into the end of the Poconos and um, we're looking at some other areas as well uh, but it will just depend on the the amount of inventories that, that, that's there and making sure that what, what we're buying meets our our criteria yeah absolutely I, I can definitely foresee especially over the next probably 12 months where um, you know there should be some more inventory right even prices coming down which will increase, you know, bringing certain homes into a, a different um, buyer's bracket because the price came down. Now, obviously, with that, though, like you mentioned, increase in interest rates, debt is especially important in projects like this. What does your typical debt structure look like? What are you aiming for there? We, um, in the past, what we've done is we usually get like a construction loan, like a, a hard money loan to rehab the property, to purchase and rehab the property. And then we refinance that after a year into something more long-term. Um, the reason we do that is because it allows us to put less cash up front. You're usually looking at like a 90% LTV. Um, and so then we can have the investors invest you know, less up front, which increases their returns. And then you've got to refinance after year one. So a lot of times you can pull out a lot of equity uh, from that refinance and you know boost returns that way too. The only downside with that is you're just dealing with a lot of paperwork. I mean, the the amount of you're now doing two loans for every single property, and it gets it gets heavy. So um, right now we're actually with interest rates the way they are and everything, we're actually looking at doing a, a new structure that will allow us to just buy homes cash um, and avoid debt entirely, so we can actually purchase get a better offering price on the homes. So, you know, cause if you're using cash, you can usually get a little bit of a discount. Um, and then, um, buying them cash, managing them and just giving a little bit a higher split to the investors to offset the amount of cash they're dumping in. Um, so that's, that's a model we're we're currently entertaining. And I think that it will, it'll be good for now. I think this, this round will be the, that's the right way to go. Um, for, for the next, I don't know, year or two. Right on. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And, and certainly a great way to avoid any kind of, uh, of, uh, debt risk is to have no debt at all. So that is a <laughs> definitely a solid, solid plan. Uh, obviously sounds like you guys have the proven models. And if you have investors who are willing to, um, you know, bring in more capital, sounds like even potentially, sort of doing this for institutions, right? So they put up the capital, then you guys use your your infrastructure to go and actually build their portfolio for them. Yeah, and that's one of the things we're talking about right now as we look to exit our first portfolio is maybe just setting aside enough capital to scale our model. We're actually in the process of um, documenting all of our processes and really nailing down our systems so that if we decide to work with uh, you know, uh, and uh, be an operator for an institutional firm. And then they, they want to spend a hundred million dollars that we can, we can put that to work and that we have a system to do that. And so we're in the process of, of making sure that we can handle that and, and having the capital on hand to hire the team we need to make, to make that happen. That's awesome. I absolutely love that structure because that's, that's going to be the, the catalyst for, um, these institutions, right? Because of course they're not going to come and buy one at a time. You know, they're going to buy either a section part of a portfolio or like this, where, you know, almost like a fund, here's a hundred million, you know, these are the terms we'd like. And then you guys have all the data to be like, cool, that's this market, this many homes, you know, so on and so yep. forth. Yep. That's exactly right. That's awesome. I love it. Love it. Big data guy. So that's, that's really cool. And uh, I look forward to, um, keeping in touch with you guys and seeing how it's going. And um, obviously I'm involved with tech investors. So um, turns out we're pretty much working hand in hand, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is pretty hilarious uh, when we found that out. But um, Jeff, this has been awesome. Appreciated your, your insight here and um, kind of this other perspective um, that you guys have over at Loma Homes. Sure. Um, so we'll wind down here and jump to the final five. Uh, first question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Best advice I've gotten from a mentor, um, I would say um, the best advice was less uh, verbal. Uh, it was more. It was more just uh, 
uh, it's just more more confidence, uh, have, having confidence in yourself, and, and making sure to just to take action and, and and move because you're never there's not there's not a right answer to to everything, and action will always trump um, analysis. So as much as the numbers matter, you got to get out there and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, money follows speed, right? As they say, and obviously you guys are moving very quickly, obviously very strategically, but moving very quickly, right? You thought, you know, the hotels are going to be the answer. It turns out it's actually, you know, uh, direct institutions and, you know, kind of all these things, but you wouldn't know it unless you were just moving through right. it and, and learning it. So I love that. Uh, what is about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Um, my why is, uh, I have a dream of, uh, teaching, uh, high school students, uh, and teaching them financial principles. I believe there's a gap in financial education of our minors. And, um, so when I set out to, when I started my own business, the goal was to retire, uh, and have enough capital to, um, work for free teaching high school. So kind of a weird, kind of a weird life, but uh, my goals of uh, are to achieve the, the the wealth I need to do that. I absolutely love that. I could not agree more. I think uh, we were actually reminiscing about this um, over the weekend, how we learned how to like write a checkbook, balance a checkbook, which is, I mean, of course, back then, right? It, it was relevant, but there's so many more pieces to finance that were far more relevant and necessary and are still there today, like credit, for instance, there's a great one that you can ruin so quickly and can take so long to fix, but nobody teaches you that. Nobody, nobody teaches that. credit. Nobody teaches investing 101. Nobody, te- I mean, it's, it's crazy. I know. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Um, can I give you an entrepreneurial book? Absolutely. Um, one of my best or my favorite books. Uh, oh man, now I'm, I've got so many in my head. I don't, I don't know which to choose, but um, so my favorite favorite entrepreneurial book right now is uh, Nail It Then Scale It. Um, it's a really good book. I think is the best entrepreneurial book on like how to start a business and like do it right. Um, but if, if you're looking for like a really good motivational, inspirational book, uh, grit by Angela Duckworth, solid. Awesome. Grit is already on the list, but nail it then scaled have not heard that one. So we added it to the list. love that. And, uh, last, uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Ah, superpower. I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a free spirit. So I think I, I think I choose to fly. Yeah, you got to. Same. Uh, cool. Uh, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? Yeah, you can uh, email us. You can email me personally at Jeff, J E F F, at Loma, L O M A dash homes, H O M E S dot com. Uh, happy to answer any questions that your listeners have. Cool. We'll link down the show notes, make it super easy. Jeff, thank you again for your time. This was awesome. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.